Welcome to Calvary Bible Baptist Church. Today, before I bring the message, I'd just like to say some good things about some faithful people. Yesterday, Beverly Turner, who had been the organist for the Calvary Bible Baptist Church for about 35 years, went home to be with the Lord. I have a bitter and sweet feelings about this. I am extremely saddened to lose a faithful sister in the Lord. I am filled with great joy and strong assurance that she's now united with her husband in heaven with the Lord Jesus Christ. One of the reasons for that is the message that I'll be bringing to you shortly. You see, we're living in a very strange time. Beverly and her husband were saved in a different time in America. Neither Beverly nor her husband ever asked Jesus Christ into their heart. Beverly and her husband repented of their sins and asked Jesus Christ to save them. Their pastor never asked Jesus Christ into his heart. He repented of his sins and asked Jesus Christ to save him. And Jesus Christ came into their hearts and into the pastor's hearts after they asked Jesus Christ to save them after they knew that they needed to be saved from going to an eternal hell because they were sinners. This doctrine of asking Jesus Christ in your heart is not the true gospel of the Bible. Jesus said you must be born again and we'll be bringing this in the message. It made something different with Bev and Jim, Jim than many Christians today. Bev and Jim, as well as your pastor, were saved sinners. And sin is, sin is kind of habit forming to the human nature. And we all sin even after we get saved. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sins. It cleanses us from past sins, present sins, and future sins. God is glorious in his character. And so we enjoyed our salvation and fellowship. And they enjoyed a faithful marriage. Their marriage was faithful to the death. My wife and I, are, as saved Christians, have enjoyed a faithful marriage unto the death. The reason for it is, I believe the difference is, is the humbling that comes from repentance towards God in faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe there's a miscarriage of the gospel and not having a proper balance in the truth of the gospel. And if I was to err, and I'll make it clear to you in a moment, there's a thing today where preachers go out and preach, and they go against the doctrine of salvation, which is once you're saved, you're saved forever. That's the truth. A, a Christian cannot lose himself because a saved Christian is not trusting in what he is doing, but he is trusting in what God has done. And when we repented of our sins and we put our trust in what Jesus Christ had done and his shed blood on Calvary's cross, we became born again. And we became servants, bond servants to the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says you are not your own, you are bought with a price. I have been, and they were purchased with blood, God's blood. That has a transforming effect on the personality of the individual that comes to the humbling experience of repentance and faith. It changes you. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Now we have an old nature that will defile us, but we have a new nature inside of us that guides us. I don't know who's saved and who's lost other than by their testimony and by their conduct. But any Christian can know for sure they're saved or lost 
by getting in the Bible and asking God, and the Holy Spirit will show you. When you're truly saved, born again, you can pray, Abba, Father. When you don't know the Lord, you can't pray, Abba, Father. When you're truly saved, your Heavenly Father will chasten you, and you'll know it. When you're not saved, you'll get away with sin and think you're lucky. Bev and Jim and their pastor, what you call old school. When the gospel was preached in truth. Now the danger that comes in is what we'll call retreads. People that got saved and then they get a guilt trip for sin that they're committed as a saved Christian, they, they need to get saved again. No, you just need to get right with your Heavenly Father. But the reverse of that, the other side of the coin is um, a false profession and never getting saved and thinking you're saved because you asked Jesus into your heart and you didn't know what you were doing. You can't join God God doesn't come into your heart to serve you. The message of the gospel is, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. It's in, the, it's in the Pauline epistles, godly sorrow that needeth not to be repented of again. It's being truly sorry, knowing you're wrong, and knowing that your sins are sending you to an eternal hell and damnation, and you have no hope and you need somebody to change you and do something. God sent a son to the world to die on Calvary's cross, shed his blood, and make the propitiation, the payment for the sins. And it changes an individual. They don't ever become non-sinless. Christians will sin. But a Christian will have an advocate with the Father, and he confesses his sins daily to God, and he gets cleansing for fellowship, not for redemption. But I think we have a lot of miscarriages today. We call it easy believism. And so today's message is the old-fashioned, the old-style gospel preaching, dealing with the issues of the heart. And this is for Beverly Turner and her husband Jim. Two Christians, sinners saved by grace, faithful to the Lord in service over many years, greatly appreciated by their pastor. And now they're together with the Lord. We would, we will do our message. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege to be Christians. Father, we thank you for your truth. Father, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy and your kindness. And Father, may we preach the gospel and show the ugly nature of humanity versus the godliness and goodness of your righteousness and redemption. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you please put ambition and rule thy lust without? Thank you. Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? In thy name have cast out devils? In thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Heavenly Father, if there's anyone here that's not saved, the prayer is that they become born again through repentance and faith. If there's anyone that hear this message that's not saved, that they would. And for all those that are saved, that they'd be encouraged to be obedient to their Savior and love Him through obedience and love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. These verses apply to many falsely professing Christians seeking worldly gain or honor while avoiding the humbling of repentance and faith in Jesus Christ to the redemption of their eternal soul. 
Paul was very clear with the gospel, testifying both to the Jews and also the Greeks, repentance towards God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. That doctrine is not being preached much today. And I want you to know and understand that doctrine. When a man is walking through life, committing sins, he's on a road to damnation, he's on the road to hell. Having only been born once and born into this world, the law expects him to live a sinless, harmless life, which he cannot and he will not do. And he'll commit sins of omission, he'll commit sins of commission, and he will be under the wrath of God for the violation of God's holiness. He's on the road to destruction. He's on the path to hell. When he dies, he's going to hell. He's going to pay the price for his sins and his iniquities before a holy God. And God says, turn you at my reproof. And that's the message of the gospel. Turn you at my reproof. God expects a man and is calling a man to turn to him. And then the Lord shows him his love for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life for God sent not a son in the world condemned the world but the world through him might be saved salvation comes when a man turns to God and sees his hopelessness and knows that God must condemn him to an eternal damnation for his sins and he asks God for a remedy. That remedy is the shed blood of Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross. He who was without sin was made sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That's the message of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, testifying to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance towards God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Many people believe their good works will get them to heaven. I know because I witness to people and I say, have you been saved? Are you born? I'm okay, preacher. I'm okay. And I tell them, you must be born again. You need to have Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior. No, don't worry about me, preacher. I'm okay. I'm okay. No, you're not okay. Many people who believe their good works will get them to heaven are trusting that they are Christians. But to be a Christian requires a second birth, not good works. There must first be a natural birth, and then there must be a spiritual birth. Jesus answered unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time in his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, in our modern age, it's hard for some people to understand the simplicity and the truth of the Bible. But when a baby is born, he's in his mom's embryonic sac. And when he comes out at a birth, it's a kapush. He's born of water. He's born physically. But that's not enough to get into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said that you must be born again. A man needs a second birth. You must be born again. That second birth is a spiritual birth. After receiving Jesus Christ as Savior through repentance and faith, the expectation of a Christian is good works in the Savior's grace. I want you to see that, that being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, this is the minister's job, affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. Once you're saved, you are to live like a child of the king, not like a heathen and a devil. God wants you to have good works that glorify him for what he did for you. These things are good and profitable unto men. Good works are to be found in the walk of the Christian out of a heart of love 
to their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, God put it this way, O ye sons of men, how long will you turn my glory into shame? Do you realize a holy God shed holy blood on the cross of Calvary to redeem an unholy soul and make it pure and clean and make it holy? Therefore, when you're born again, the expectation of your heavenly Father is that you walk like a child of the King, you act like a child of the King, you conduct yourself as a child of the King, and the Bible tells us in Peter, be ye holy, for he is holy that calls you. But know that the Lord God, excuse me, but know that the Lord has set apart him that is godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call unto him. One of the great deceptions today in America, in American culture, one of the great lies is niceness for godliness. And I tell you, I'm going to explain it to you so you'll get it. I get sick of nice people. I'm looking for some godly people. You say, what's wrong with being nice? Nice is phony. I'm acting nice to you because I should act nice to you because I want to get something from you. That isn't the way God wants you to be. God wants you to be godly and kindly affectionate and have loving kindness to everyone all the time without seeking anything. That's godliness. Say, why are you being nice to me? Because that's the nature of God. It is the goodness of God that leads to repentance. Why are you being nice to me? Because God is holy, and in his holiness, he's harmless. And that's what you're exhorted to be as Christians, harmless. Our liberty in the shed blood of Jesus Christ constrains us to walk in the holiness and spirit of grace. The spirit of grace is found in Galatians. For brethren, ye have been called on to liberty. What a glorious liberty. When God forgives our sins in his character and his holiness, he washes away all of our sins, past, present, and future. But we're, can, we're, we're told, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if ye bite and devour one another, Take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You see, you have a spirit in you of a holy God when you're born again, because your dead spirit, which was dead in trespasses and sins, is made alive unto God. And you need to follow that spirit and walk in that spirit. And that spirit will make you harmless and holy as the author of that spirit, God himself. This I say, walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. The title of today's message is Ambition, Rule Thy Lust. Ambition is of the flesh in most cases. And it's what's destroying Christians or it's making false Christians. God knoweth, not I. Ambition that is rooted in the desires of the lust of the flesh brings destruction and damnation to those who are ruled by such lusts. With him is strength and wisdom. The deceived and deceiver are his. He leadeth counselors away, spoiled, and maketh judges fools. God is not to be trifled with. God is seriously holy. God has a sense of humor. God has great kindness, but he's also a righteous judge. Ambition is a desire of preferment. Now, be aware, this is the nature of the flesh. Ambition is a desire of a preferment or of an honor, a desire of excellence or superiority. This word had its origin in the practice of the many Roman candidates for office who went about the city to solicit votes. It is the human nature to want people to like you, to want people to think good of you, to want to have a superiority 
that we don't really have. And he said unto her, What wilt thou? She said unto him, Grant that these my two sons may sit the one on thy right hand and the other on the left in thy kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, Ye know not what ye ask. Now here's this woman, and it appears that she may be humble because she's asking for her sons. But look, what you miss in human nature, if her sons get on the left and right hand of the Lord, those were her kids. That elevates her. And of course, they're not going to object. Everybody wants to rule. But Jesus answered said, Ye know not what ye ask. Are ye able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of, and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? See here the divine nature. The lawgiver, the holy one, the creator, the I am, has now become man. And he's going to a cross. He's going to be stripped naked. He's going to be spat upon. He's going to be despised and rejected of men. And he's not going to answer or complain. He's going to go up there. And when they nail him naked before all, he's going to cry to his heavenly father for a propitiation. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He's going to shed his blood and allow his life to be drained. And he's going to descend into the pelly of hell. He's going to deposit the sins of all humanity there. And then when no man could help him and no power beyond his own power could do anything, he's going to bring himself up from the grave and from death and he's going to be alive. He's going to be alive forevermore and he's going to offer propitiation through his shed blood. He's going to offer a substitutionary atonement, his righteousness for your righteousness, if you'd only humble yourself through repentance and cry out to him, God! Be merciful to me, a sinner, and mean it. And he'll take your place, he'll take your stripes, he'll take your sins, so that you can live now to and for him in righteousness. When it is used in a good sense, emulation may spring from a laudable ambition to be Christ-like. Far and rare today is the ambition for godliness. But it's found here in Romans. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. America has substituted lust for love. When Americans say, I love you, they say, I lust you. It just doesn't make good grammar and sound right. But love is always giving for the betterment of another. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. I am the good shepherd, and I give my life for the sheep. Such is the nature of the divine and the truth of godly love. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. If you have to harm somebody or hurt somebody, you're wrong. Now, we're not talking about telling people the truth, which can hurt. And we're not talking about bringing justice from time to time, which can hurt. But justice has to be impartial. It cannot be revenge. And that knowing the time, that now it's high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation near than when we believe. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. What? But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provisions for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. However, when ambition of the flesh denotes an inordinate desire of power or preeminence, it is most often accompanied with illegal means to obtain that object. In the Old Testament, there's a curse on those that would do God's work deceitfully. 
Cursed be he that doth the work of the Lord deceitfully, and cursed be he that keepeth back his sword from blood. This is not true of the ambition of humility to emulate Jesus Christ. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier. If you're going to emulate the Lord Jesus Christ, it's going to take an internal strength. It's going to take the hidden man, the heart, working in you and out through you to endure hardness in a harsh and a cruel and a wicked and a forward generation. No man that warreth entangle himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And if a man also strive for the masteries, yet he is not crowned except he strive lawfully. You cannot do God's work in sin. You can only do God's work lawfully. Now, you can witness, and you'll be a sinner, but what's going to bring people to Christ? It's God's word that's going to do the work. The Apostle Paul understood that building upon another man's foundation was fraud and without faith. Yea, so have I strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. But as it is written, to whom he was not spoken of, they shall see, and they that have not heard shall understand. A glaring example of ambition without faith is seen in David's general, Joab. Ambition, rule thy lust. Moreover, thou knowest also what Joab the son of Zerai did to me, and what he did to the two captains of the host of Israel, unto Abner the son of Ner, and unto Amasa the son of Jether, whom he slew and shed blood of war in peace, and put the blood of war upon his girdle, that was about his loins and in his shoes that were on his feet. Do therefore according to thy wisdom and let not his whore head go down to the grave in peace. David is speaking this of the man that was his lieutenant, his chief general for many, many years in Israel. Why was this spoken by David? Well, Joab was David's general. He was also David's nephew, the son of David's sister, Uri. He should have served David in the love of family, in the love of country, in the brotherhood of Israel. But lust ruled his ambition. Romans warns us, not as though the word of God had taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. You remember Jesus spoke to those folks and said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord. Not everyone that says, I did this and I did that and I did this and I did that. Did you do it for Jesus or did you do it for position? Did you do it for rank? Did you do it for acceptance? What is the reason you're doing what you're doing? The Lord is not as concerned of what you do as he is as to why you're doing it. What's your motivation? What's your heart all about? Joab was a thoroughly competent man, a ruthless, cold-blooded man, a man that was also a first-class fighting man. He was fiercely loyal to David so long as it served his interest. Joab would have been a popular man today. We, um, we like champions, don't we? But there's different kinds of champions. My champion is Jesus Christ. His strength was shown in weakness. But most of our champions are our modern gladiators. We're like the Romans. Joab would have been very popular he would have done very well in the arena. He was a man's man. He was a warring man. But you're warned. Lay not up for yourselves treasure on earth, where moss and wrath doth corrupt, 
where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You know what's neglected today is the truth of the scriptures. I don't hear anybody preach. That which is highly esteemed amongst men, men like Joab, men like your champions, is an abomination in the sight of God. God's looking for the humble heart. God's looking for the holy man. The man that will crucify his flesh and take up a cross and follow his Savior. He spent his life fighting David's cause, but he never loved David. And in the end, he, he was handed over by David for execution, exactly as those who profess Jesus Christ but do not love him. Paul put this truth, you don't hear this preached. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema maranatha. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. Anathema, damned at his coming. Paul says, if a man does not love Jesus Christ, let him be damned at his coming. You can't love Jesus Christ by asking him into your heart. If you want to love Jesus Christ, you have to go to him in repentance because his way is perfect and our way is wrong. And that's all there is to it. Joab illustrates those who profess to be on the Lord's side but who do not truly know him in the relationship to him as redeemer and redeemed. God said this, they will not frame their doings to turn on to their God for the spirit of whoredoms is in the midst of them and they have not known the Lord. You know what the big thing is today with the young folks? Let's go to a rock concert, let's say Jesus and let's fornicate. God says that's a whoredoms, physical and spiritual. <clears throat> God calls all sexual sins outside of marriage fornication. If any soul be, is truly born again, Christian, they must have the Lord's Spirit in them to be so. Now, I want to tell you this. I don't know who's saved and who's lost. And the men that tell you they do, they're lying through their teeth. Only God can look upon the heart. But God knows. And I think the devil knows. I'm limited to your profession. You're limited to my profession. And you're limited to my works and my fruits. And I'm limited to your works and your fruits. And they don't tell the truth of the heart. You've got to look on the heart to know the truth. And God looks right in there. For to be cardinally minded is death. Well, we'll take Jesus in our rock concert, in our miniskirts, in our sensual dancing, in our gyrating, in our jumping up and down. You are crazy. For to be cardinally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. You got Christians today sinning, disobeying God. So I got peace. You didn't get it from God. There's no peace to the wicked, saith my God. Because a carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be, the spirit of God dwelleth in you. Now if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. He goes, well, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. 
I fornicate for Jesus. They had a stripper said, I strip for Jesus. You don't strip for Jesus. And she says she tithe her earnings. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. Now, I think the reason that all this is taking place is the fact that, and the truth of God's character and goodness, is once you're saved, you can't commit a sin that will send you to hell, but... The, Christians are afraid to judge righteous judgment on conduct and say, it ain't right. You may be saved, but it ain't right to lie. You may be saved, but it ain't right to steal. You may be saved, but it ain't right to be a stripper for Jesus. You may be saved, but it ain't right to be a whore for Jesus. And one wonders, if you've ever repented and asked Christ to be your Lord and Savior. He had a family loyal to David as his mother was David's sister. But family relationships or group relationships do not make people a Christian. Just because your mama was a Christian, that don't mean you're a Christian. Just because your daddy was a good Christian, that don't mean you're a Christian. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. There are many of a godly Christian parent today that have angry, rebellious, mean-spirited, rotten kids that want to live in sin and wickedness and say they're a Christian because they came out of a Christian home and they don't know their Lord and Savior. And they don't want people like me preaching what I'm preaching because they want to be comfortable Christians, but they'll die and go to hell. And I'm a good friend, and I'm going to tell them the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And what you're doing is wrong. And if you're walking in the Spirit, I I can't say you're not saved, but I can tell you truly you're not walking in the Spirit. If you were walking in the Spirit, you'd be filled with godliness. You'd be filled with loving kindness. You'd be a different preacher, a different teacher, a different Christian, a different mom, a different child. Uh, You'd be different. He subscribed to the obvious fact that David was Israel's deliverer as demonstrating the feet of the Philistines and the giant. So professors also believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. Just because you believe in your head that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world, just because you're willing to tell someone, well, I believe Jesus is God, the devil does too, and he believes it more than you. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given amongst men whereby we must be saved. There's nobody else that died for your sins. There's no one in recorded history. All others are just a different philosophy. This is the one that died for your sins. He was fundamentally loyal to David and granted that David was the true king of Israel. You see, thou believest that there is one God, thou dost well, that's a good thing, but that isn't salvation. The devils also believe and tremble and they're going to hell. He granted that David was sufficient as Israel needed no one else to be its king. Now, when the Lord was being crucified, this Roman centurion saw something. He saw a truth, but that didn't mean he received it. He just saw it. Now, when the centurion, when they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. Now, I'll say it in a worldly sense. If there is a Son of God, and is, if there is a Savior of the world, the only one that could be is Jesus. But that doesn't mean you're a believer, a follower, that you've repented of your sins and trust Christ as your Savior. That just means you're acknowledging the fact. 
However, he betrayed himself in the case of Uriah the Hittite. And it came to pass in the morning that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And he wrote in the letter saying, Set ye Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle, and retire ye from him, that he may be smitten and die. And it came to pass, when Joab observed the city, that, the, uh, that he assigned Uriah to a place where he knew that the valiant men were. And the men of the city went out and fought with Joab, and there fell some of the people of the servants of David, and Uriah the Hittite died also. To keep his rank, place, and position, he murdered a man. If he had any character whatsoever, if he had any spirit of the Lord in him, he would have wrote a letter to David and said, I cannot do an unlawful deed. And if David said, do it or give up your position, he would have resigned. No, he didn't want to jeopardize his rank and position. He wasn't serving David because he was loyal to David. If he was a loyal servant and friend to David, he would have said, you're the king, but it's not right for a king to do what you want me to do. He murdered a man simply to hold his rank and his position, disdaining the way of David, who would not murder to seize power. It came to pass afterward that David's heart smote him, because he had cut off Saul's skirt. And he said unto his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing unto my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch forth my hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. So David stayed his servants with these words and suffered them not to rise against Saul. But Saul rose up out of the cave and went on his way. You know, the truth is, a spirit-led Christian, the Lord's Christians, are harmless. That ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. We're in darkness. You know what the problem with darkness is? There's very few true lights. You realize at nighttime, most of the lights you see are not true lights. They're electric lights. You got limited light from the stars, you got limited light from the moon, and that's reflective light. That's, that's a picture of the church reflecting the light of the sun. As a, as a Christian, I can only reflect the light of my Savior. He betrayed himself in the case of Abner, the son of Ner, whom he murdered in vengeance and the fear of losing his rank and position to Abner. And Abner said unto David, I will arise and go and will gather all Israel unto my lord the king, that they may make a league with thee, and that thou mayest reign over all thy heart desire. And David sent Abner away, and he went in peace. Abner had come to David to bring the kingdom to peace and end a civil war in which the brethren of Israel were killing one another. And Abner had killed Ahishahel in war, in battle, trying not to kill the young man, telling the young man not to keep coming after him, to go fight with somebody else. And now Abner is going to be murdered for vengeance, and I believe also for the fear of losing his position, because Abner would likely, being another relative, it was a family affair, become David's general, because he was Saul's general. And when Joab was come out from David, he sent messengers after Abner, which brought him again from the well of Syria. But David knew it not. And when Abner was returned to Hebron, Joab took him aside in the gate to speak with him quietly and smote him there under the fifth rib, that he died for the blood of Ashiel, his brother. And afterward, when David heard it, he said, I and my kingdom are guiltless before the Lord forever for the blood of Abner, the son of Ner. I want you to see Ambition, rule thy lust. Men are being killed, and everyone that's being killed is being killed when they're defenseless. They're being taken out by surprise. Poor Uriah, he didn't know. He's just following orders. A good, a good, 
godly Christian soldier to the death. Abner, he's come to bring peace. He's called aside for counsel, but he's called just outside Hebron, one of the cities of refuge, just outside the gate. And Abner feigns friendship and comes up and sticks him unawares. Joab disdained the mind of David. A song of the degrees of David. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard that went down to the skirts of his garments, as the dew of Hermon, as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life evermore. The civil war would have ended, the dying would have ended, the killing would have ended, but God didn't care. He wanted his place. He wanted his lust. He wanted his rank. And he murdered for it. All the time being an Israelite. He betrayed himself in the case of Absalom. For when a certain discovered him helpless hanging in a tree, he murdered him. And the man said unto Joab, Though I should receive a thousand shekels of silver in my hand, yet would I not put forth my hand against the king's son? For in our hearing the king charged thee, and Abishai and Ithai, saying, Beware that none touch the young man Absalom. Otherwise I should have wrought falsehood against my own life. For there is no matter hid from the king, and thou thyself would have set thyself against me. Now there's a man that sees Joab. Thou thyself would have set thyself against me because it would have been your rank and position when the king ordered my execution. Then said Joab, I may not tarry thus with thee. And he took three darts in his hand and went and thrust them through the heart of Absalom while he was yet alive in the midst of the oak. Now I want to tell you, Absalom deserved what he got, as every sinner deserves hell. But the Heavenly Father, as David be a father, loved his son. He wanted to redeem his son the way God wants to redeem every fallen, sinful son on this earth. For God is willing that none should perish. And Absalom and all his wickedness and all his betrayal and his bringing on a civil war in Israel. The father wanted to redeem his son and restore him. And the king was much moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept as he went. Thus he said, O oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would God I had died? For thee, O Absalom, my son, my son. Such was the heart of David, and the heart of God towards the children of men. How wicked we are, how ungodly and depraved and mean and hateful and rank and privilege and lust and desires. And God wants to redeem us. And we have the audacity as Joab to feign ourselves as Christians or as any religious thing when we need redemption. He betrayed himself in the case of Adjaniah. Then Adjaniah, the son of Haggath, exalted himself, saying, I will be king. And he prepared him chariots and horsemen and fifty men to rule before him. And his father had not displeased him at any time in saying, why hast thou done so? And he also was a very goodly man, and his mother bare him after Absalom. And he conferred with Joab the son of Zerai, with Abithiar the priest, and they following Adjaniah helped him. But Zodok the priest, and Benaniah the son of Jehodiah, and Nathan the prophet, and Shimei, and Rei, and the mighty men which belonged to David were not with Adjaniah. David had clearly told the people that Solomon would rule. But Adjaniah, ambition, rule thy lust, wanted the kingdom. And Joab believed he was going to get the kingdom because he took the initiative. And Joab went after him. Because Joab wanted to maintain his rank and his position. 
He cared not for David his king. He knew not David his king. As many Christians, and I don't know which is which, know not their Lord. And as many are not saved, don't even know God. God knoweth, I can only give you the truth. You must be born again. The Spirit's got to be changed. The Spirit's dead. And Joab's spirit is not akin to David's. He disobeyed the known will of David. And the king swore and said, As the Lord liveth, that hath redeemed my soul out of all distress, even as I swear unto thee by the Lord God of Israel, saying, Assuredly, Solomon, thy son, shall reign after me, and he shall sit upon my throne in my stead, even so will I certainly do this day. You know who's going to rule this world? You know who God the Father said, Assuredly, it's Jesus Christ the righteous. He's coming back. And you know what they miss about the battle of Armageddon? Is this, the great tribulation when the wrath of God is poured out, that's men fighting men. But at the end of that thing, when God comes back, that's the world fighting God. And the Lord Jesus Christ destroys the armies of the world that hate him, that want an Adjaniah rather than Jesus Christ, the righteous. Whose side you on? Who's your God? Who do you love? Now, I speak for no others, but as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. Christ the King. Christ my Lord. Blood-bought sinner. Constrained by the Holy Spirit to do good and right things. Fighting an evil flesh that wants to disobey. So, finally, God's justice comes. He was slain at the command of Solomon, holding on to the horns of the altar where the blood of a murderer could not make atonement for his treachery. There's no record ever in the life of Joab where he put himself under the blood in the Old Testament. I'm sure he must have done a few things, but it wasn't in spirit and truth. For they that worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth. He was interested in his lust, his rank, his position, his power. He was an ambitious man, and ambition ruled his lust. Their blood, therefore, shall return upon the head of Joab, upon the head of his seed forever. But upon David, and upon his seed, and upon his house, and upon his throne, there shall be peace forever from the Lord. So Benaniah, the son of Jehodiah, went up and fell on him and slew him. Now watch. And he was buried in his own house in the wilderness. He was buried in his own house in the wilderness. Joab went to hell. He wasn't saved by grace. He was under a legal system with blood atonements. And it had to be made once every year. On Yom Kippur, the holiest day of the year. No record. He died slain by the king, Solomon. A picture and type of Christ in the millennium. He never had a true heart. No repentance. No faith. But he played the role. He even issued great swallowing words. In a battle, he said, you go there, and I'll go there. Let us play the man for our God. But his heart was not with his king. And many are, did not have their heart with Christ. You must be born again. 
repentance. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. My way is wrong. My sins are evil. I deserve a hell. Forgive me. I need your grace. I have to have your mercy. Take away my sins. Save me from my destruction. You know what God is? Kindly affection. The goodness of God leads to repentance. All you have to do is put your faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And God will forgive your sins, past, present, and future. But when you receive him in truth, the Holy Spirit will come into you. And you will have a war between that spirit of godliness and the ambition of thy lust. And you're exhorted to walk in the spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. There's something wrong in Christianity today. I don't know which it is. It's either not getting saved or it's not being faithful but there's something wrong when Christians aren't fighting the fight and warring against the flesh and crucifying it. and the Bible says and you'll notice with Joab there was never any chastisement when David sinned his sin there was humility and prayer and a crying for mercy because there had been chastisement. Joab never got any chastisement. The Bible says, no chastisement, then are you bastards and not sons. If you're professing to be a Christian and your father hasn't chastened you, I would be fearful that you are a Christian because my father has chastened me many times in my life because he's a loving father. He wants the best for me. He wants right for me. Now, you can't tell me he doesn't want the same for you. I know my father and my father is good. I know my father and he's holy. I know my father and he's filled with loving kindness. I know my father and he's just. I know my father and he's true. I know my father and he's He's altogether lovely. I know him. And he's harmless. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege to be Christians. Father, we thank you for your goodness, and we thank you for your truth. In Jesus' name we pray.